because it's nothing more than a giant open pit. There are no men in here working with traditional gold pans, nor are you likely to see entrances to the great deep mining tunnels of the quartz mines, because this is a hydraulic gold mine. And as such, it's one of the most historically significant spots in California. The process of hydraulic gold mining is important to California in many ways. First of all, hydraulic mining was born and raised in California. Furthermore, it was the cheapest, most efficient method ever devised to recover gold from the river gravels, where gold is most often found. But to Californians, it has a special significance. It was once the issue of a famous war between the gold miners of the mountains and the farmers of the valleys below. And from that war grew one of the most important concepts of government regulation over private enterprise. Hydraulic gold mining was dramatic. Everything about it was loaded with drama and excitement. But what's most important to us today is that this chapter of California history is disappearing before our very eyes. Because I'm standing in the last hydraulic gold mine to exist in the California mother load. And when this cannon fires its final shot, hydraulic gold mining will probably die forever in the very territory that gave it birth. Now, in 1848, when gold was discovered in California, men came here from all over the world to seek it out. But it wasn't long before they picked up all of the easy gold, and they began to be faced with the fantastic engineering problems of getting gold out of the secret places where it had lain for millions of years. Now, these men were among the most resourceful in the world. And right here on the spot, they solved problems that seemed unsolvable. Take this problem right here, for example. That hillside is no ordinary pile of rocks. That's the bed of a river that flowed over 30 million years ago in a time that the geologists called the tertiary period. And that river carried gold down from the higher mountains. But later, a giant upheaval of earth came along and buried many of these rivers. They disappeared under tons of newer earth and the gold that was in them was buried as well. This riverbed, along with many others, was eventually uncovered by new rivers that cut deep channels so deep that they crossed the old rivers. And wherever this happened, a little of the tertiary gold leaked out and gave the miners their first clue of where the gold was hiding. But the problem was how to get the gold out. There are thousands of dollars worth of gold in that hillside but it's also mixed in with millions of tons of packed river gravel, packed so hard that the miners themselves used to call it cement. The miners knew that if they could just get the gold loose from the hillsides, they could easily separate the gold from the gravel by running the aggregate through long sluices, pushed along by stream water. They could put barriers or riffles into the sluices that would catch the gold and yet let the gravel and the mud go through because gold is heavier than anything it travels with. And if the sluice was long enough, eventually the gold would drop to the bottom and stick there behind the riffles. But how do you get a mountainside free enough to sluice? Well, the process was simple once they figured out the necessary equipment. If water had placed the gold in those riverbeds to begin with, why not use water to blast it loose again? Well, that's exactly what they did. The miners fired enormous blasts of water against those old riverbanks and let them roll down through their sluices and over the riffles, carried by this new man-made river. All this was made possible by the invention of a single piece of equipment. And here it is, the key to the whole solution, a water cannon fashioned after a Civil War artillery piece. These cannons were called monitors, and this particular type was affectionately called the Little Giant. This Little Giant was first built for the Omega Mine nearly a hundred years ago, and is still being used today by Bill Wilson. It weighs one and a half tons, and yet one man can make it move as gracefully as a ballet dancer. The trick lies in the ball joint up front that holds the nozzle. The power to direct the cannon up and down and from side to side comes from the backlash or counterforce of the water jet blasting out of the nozzle. As Bill Wilson moves the rods that aim the nozzle, the water stream is deflected, moving the cannon in whatever direction Bill wants it to go. Because of this ingenious power source, 
Bill can operate this entire hydraulic mine alone. The whole operation, of course, depends on getting a powerful head of water going through the cannon. The water jet that comes through this monitor throws a punch of 5,000 pounds. That's two and a half tons. It could demolish a building or cut a human being to ribbons. In one minute, it throws out 16,000 gallons of water, about equivalent to the capacity of one and a half railroad tank cars. In 24 hours of operation, this one monitor can move 4,000 cubic yards of gravel down the bank and through the sluices, including trees, boulders, mud, and of course, the precious gold. And even though there may be less gold in every cubic yard than one quarter the size of a copper penny, it's considered rich ore to the hydraulic miner. The most amazing part of this whole process is that every pound of water pressure released by this cannon comes from gravity alone. It is literally falling water that drops down from the streams and reservoirs high above us in the mountains. And then it's caught by huge iron pipes for the final fall down to the monitor. This particular pipe leads to a reservoir 1,500 feet up the mountain. Because of the angle of the pipe, the vertical drop is only 250 feet. In some of the old hydraulic mines, the vertical drop was four and 500 feet. Water was the great key to hydraulicking. First, you gathered it high in the mountain. Then you sent it plunging to the mines in closed pipes called penstocks. Here the monitors fired the water against the gold-bearing gravels, washing it into the sluices where the gold was caught by riffles. And it was water that unlocked the gold from gravel, mud, sand, in almost every early mining method, panning, sluicing, dredging, and hydraulicking. But this same water gave hydraulic mining its tragic flaw. And to find that flaw, we have to go back to the beginning. The Sacramento Valley in California looks very much like a big, flat-bottomed bathtub, with mountain ranges forming the sides. On the east are the Sierra Mountains, and rolling gently into the Sacramento Valley from the Sierra are four of the most famous gold-bearing rivers, the Feather, the Yuba, the Bear, and the American. It was up these rivers that the Argonauts of 1849 searched for their first gold, the Placer Gold. By 1852, a miner named Anthony Chabot had invented the first crude hydraulic technique, a wooden pipe that carried water down the riverbank to a canvas hose. He was able to erode away the softer parts of the bank in this fashion and save himself and his partners a lot of work. It took until about 1870 for the process to reach maturity, with many years wasted in the slow development of monitors and hoses. Eventually, iron pipes were introduced, forged right in the mining pits themselves. And the famous little giant monitor with its aimable nozzle was the final piece of perfection and refinement. By 1880, in the three most active hydraulic counties alone, there were 41,000 men at work. The biggest of the hydraulic mines was the North Bloomfield, a consolidation of many smaller mines, and an enormous, heavily financed company in itself. Now, what we're talking about is one of the greatest ventures of man, one that literally changed the face of the earth. And this is the biggest and most famous of all of the hydraulic pits, the North Bloomfield's famous Malakoff mine. This ghostly natural monument to hydraulic mining is still such a dramatic sight that it has been designated a California state park. It was the North Bloomfield that first introduced long distance telephone lines to connect its holdings and installed electric lights for 24 hour operation. Although many smaller mines would stop only once a year to clean the gold out of their sluices, the North Bloomfield held a cleanup once a month. The most dramatic evidence of the size and success of the operation here at the North Bloomfield is this replica of a cleanup block they smelted from the hydraulicking of one month. 
January 1882. This block of gold, accumulated from millions of tiny flakes almost powder fine, weighed 510 pounds and was worth over $114,000. In 18 years of operation, the North Bloomfield total gold yield amounted to nearly $3 million. The excitement of hydraulic gold mining reached all the way from the investment circles of San Francisco, New York, and London, right back into the hydraulic pits themselves. One reporter came out from the San Francisco Bulletin in 1879. He may have been standing on this very spot. And what he wrote was very exciting because it made, it, it made the operation sound like something out of another world. He wrote, we stand on the brink of the mine and try to fix the salient points in thought and memory before we descend into the great amphitheater, vaster in its circle than the stony base of the Colosseum. As we turn to descend, a measured succession of sounds begin. Far down under the highest cliff, on the sloping bedrock and half hid in the shadow are a multitude of men. The water has done its work here and washed out all the loose earth and smaller rocks. There's a real pleasure, very distinct but hard to describe, about this gigantic force issuing from the monitors. This is the water that left the reservoir a few hours ago and has been worried and tumbled and beaten into foam until one might easily believe that it comes out not merely with the force of much gravity, but also with a wicked, vicious, unutterable indignation. You hear little rattling and slipping noises through the incessant roar and a stream which seems 10 times greater than could have come out of the pipe flows down the dripping pile and so into the rock channels which lead to the tunnel. Unfortunately, the reporter who made that account of the great hydraulic pits didn't go quite far enough because where I am right now is where the trouble began. Behind me and up this sluice is a hydraulic mining pit. Up there, the miners were more concerned with the amount of water pressure they could force through their monitors, the depth of the overburden, the amount of gold per cubic yard or per ton of riverbank, the number of riffles they needed to stop the gold but let the tailings go on through. But at this point right here, the miner lost completely his interest in the process. From this particular ledge, for example, these tailings dropped 1,200 feet into the American River below. But then what? It was what happened at this point with this great tide of sand and mud and gravel after passing through the sluices and the tunnels that finally choked hydraulic gold mining to death. These were the tailings, the tragic tailings that crept down hundreds of canyons like this one to the Sacramento Valley until the mouths of the Feather, the Yuba, the American, and the Bear Rivers became great glaciers of mud. In the 1870s and 80s, these rivers were carrying millions of tons of hydraulic mud down from the tailings of the mines. And as the fast mountain rivers slowed down in the flat valley, the mud settled and began to build up year by year until every little rise in the river level meant a disastrous flood to the valley people. During the 20 years of the most concentrated hydraulic mining, the bed of the Sacramento River rose 16 feet. River traffic became impossible. San Francisco Bay turned brown the year round. And on the farms outside of the river towns, hundreds of acres of fruit orchards were strangled. Roads disappeared. Fences were buried. Houses filled with mud. And here in Marysville, one single flood left three feet of mud down on those streets. The Sacramento Riverbed was once higher than the streets of the city. Because of these levees, Marysville and Yuba City are called the walled cities. And actually, they have been, more than once, like cities under siege. Mud was the cause of the bitter war that the farmers fought against the miners for their very existence. Fortunately, most of the battle was fought in the legislature and the courts, but it was a long and mean fight. The farmers tried to get injunctions against the miners and failed. They sued the miners and failed. They built levees that burst. But in 1880, the farmers succeeded in getting the legislature to appoint a state engineer to investigate. Now, his final report was terrifying. He came back with the news that every canyon was choked with mud, waiting for the rains to break it loose, a glacier of mud hanging over the valley. 
Some canyons were 100 feet deep in mud, 70 million cubic yards of it in the Yuba and Sacramento canyons alone, waiting for the final push. An annual flood was inevitable. It was clear that action had to be taken, and eventually it was. The final judgment came down from Judge Alonzo Sawyer in January 1884. His decision was so complicated that it took three and a half hours for him to read, but the word was final. All tailings must stop. And when the people down there around the telegraph office got that message, this little town went wild with joy. The church bells rang, there were steamboat whistles, people cheering in the streets, houses draped with bunting, cannon salutes, fireworks, and an enormous bonfire. The war was over, the mines must close, and the people of the valley went to bed in peace. In January 1884, when hydraulic gold mining was sentenced to death in California, the mountain towns died too. These deserted buildings around me here are what's left of the town of North Bloomfield. It closed down along with the hydraulic pits, like so many other towns of the Sierra. As the farmers had suffered for years under the slickens of the mines, now it was the miners' turn to feel the pain. Employment ceased in the mines, and one mining town after another became deserted. A new term came to these mountains, ghost town. California had made its decision. Hydraulic gold mining will become one of the great legends of California. It was a tribute to the Argonaut's ability to harness nature against herself. As the farmer sent his plow into the earth to grow his crop, so the miners set the rivers against the mountains to harvest his. Hydraulic gold mining did not die because it was inefficient. It died because it served so few and injured so many. To us and to our children, the hydraulic cannon will become the relic of a forgotten war. Today, below the silent Sierra Cliffs, only the battlefield remains.